Peter Karadordovic was born in the city of Belgrade, which at the time of his birth was part of the Principality of Serbia. His father was Alexander Karadordovic, the current Prince of Serbia, and his mother was Persida Nenadonovic. Persida came from a family of wealthy Serbian politicians and generals. Being born on July 11th of 1844 meant that he was the third born son, meaning that the chances of him becoming Prince of Serbia, let alone the King of Yugoslavia, pretty slim. These slim chances were already skewed in his favor though, as the oldest and firstborn son of Alexander and Persida had already died three years earlier before his birth. Instead of being born in his family's lavish estate, the poor Prince Peter was born at the estate of the second richest man in Serbia, whose wealth was nearly that of Prince Alexander. What a tragedy. Peter would grow up alongside his eight other siblings that would soon join him. This family was not as large as it seemed though, because Alexander and Persaida would lose their second born son in 1847, when he was just six. Now, Peter, the unlikely third son, was the heir and future prince of Serbia. Peter would have spent a lot of time in the city of Topola, a city where his family was from and still resided in for parts of the year. Peter would get his elementary level education at a private school in Belgrade. There he would learn history, math, and his native Serbian language. However, Peter's life got flipped upside down just two days before Christmas in the year of 1858. When Peter was 14, his father, Prince Alexander, would be forced to abdicate his throne in favor of Milos Obrenovic. The Obrenovic family had been the princes of Serbia since 1813, when a member of the Obrenovic family had the Kardenovic prince assassinated. The Obrenovic family rule was only interrupted when Peter's own father came to the Serbian throne in 1842. This coup was carried out by a close ally and Serbian general named Tomo Persiki. Tomo used his position of Minister of Internal Affairs to infiltrate the Serbian government and gain support for his constitutional ideas. He chose to support the Kardenovician house because he was sure that Alexander would allow for the creation of a constitutional monarchy upon becoming prince. Alexander would prove to be no different though and would refuse to relinquish any power to his people. Prince Alexander was overthrown by the Obreniviches and was forced to abdicate his throne in 1858. The 14 year old Peter was no longer an heir, but his family was still filthy frickin' rich, so they sent him to another private school, this time in the city of Geneva in Switzerland. After attending his last three years of high school in Switzerland, the 17 year old Peter chose to attend the College Saint Barb in Paris. After attending this prestigious university for a year, Peter decided that the liberal studies just weren't for him. So after a year of college, Peter joined Saint Cyr, a military academy. After all, how else could he regain the principality that his father had lost? After three years of military training, he graduated in 1864. Then for a period of about two years, Peter pursued his own interests of early photography as well as reading works from the premier political philosophers of his time. That included names like John Stuart Mills and Karl Marx. He followed this self-guided journey for about two years, then in 1866 he enrolled and was accepted into another military academy. This time, it was the Higher Military School, located in the French city of Metz. He only attended for a year as he started to become more and more involved in the ideals of mid-19th century political philosophies. In particular, he read and supported, perhaps a tad hypocritically, the book Liberty, that was published by John Stuart Mill in 1859. The main idea surrounding the book Liberty is the idea that the concept of individuality is the most important thing to maintain in a society or country. John Stuart Mill, in this book, also sets standards and clearly defines how much authority a government can and should have over the individual. Peter supported this idea so much that he translated the English book into a Serbian one in 1868. This was a beyond smart move. By doing this, he gained influence and fame all over Serbia, while also causing the people of Serbia to question and protest the rule of the Obrenovic dynasty. Peter remained in France, even as tensions were rising with one of their neighbors. Otto von Bismarck, the Chancellor of Prussia, decided to attack France as a way to build German nationalism. Bismarck devised this plan to unite with his allies, the other five German nations, not including Prussia. Even as tensions were boiling to a point of explosion, Peter remained in France. He was not wasting his four years of military training as he enlisted at the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War. Deciding that he did not want to be a political prisoner, he shortened his last name to Kara. The French army secretly knew who he was, of course, as he was immediately given the rank of lieutenant. He fought with the 1st French Foreign Regiment and participated in the Second Battle of Orléans and the Battle of villers saxel the latter of which would be one of the very few French victories over the duration of this whole war. For participating in these two battles, Peter Kara was awarded with a Legion of Honor medal, joining an elite group of French soldiers. Shortly after receiving this medal, Peter was captured by Prussian soldiers. While in captivity, Peter managed to remain incognito and his true identity was never revealed to the Prussians. One night, Peter escaped, 
and managed to make it back to the French lines before anyone even realized that the French lieutenant with the Serbian accent was gone. Then Peter joined the French commune towards the end of the war. This new French government promoted a lot of things, but mostly communism and socialism, as well as being anti-religious, even executing the Parisian archbishop. This government only lasted two months before the takeover of the Third French Republic. Peter was spared by this new government that let the distinguished foreign veteran continue to live in France. As nationalism had united the six German nations into one, it was tearing apart the fabric of other nations, namely the old and large Austro-Hungarian empires, as well as the Ottoman Empire, who both had numerous ethnic groups living under their domain that progressively tried to seek independent rule. One of these ethnic groups were the Bosnians. The Bosnians are often called the Bosnian Serbs, and both the Bosnians and the Serbians share very similar cultures and ethnicities. Seeing a chance to win back the favor of his people, Peter decided that it was time to go back home. Well, almost to home. He was in Bosnia for a large portion of the 1875 nationalist revolutions that plagued the Ottoman-controlled Balkans. To gather support, he first arrived in the southern Austro-Hungarian regions that held a large minority group of Bosnians. Despite using one of his aliases, the Obrinovich family had found out that the young, former heir was close and had his own army. Well, it was less of an army and more of a band of 200 hastily trained guerrilla fighters. This band of 200 men only attracted unwanted attention to Peter, as the rival family plotted and planned to assassinate him. After hearing about what would become his untimely death, he decided to flee back to Austria, having accomplished little more than banditry. After staying in Austria for a winter, Peter reorganized a new army and marched back into Bosnia. This time, he got more of a foothold and managed to split the Bosnian rebels between him, the Prince of Serbia, Milan Obrenovic, and a group that supported the Austrian annexation of Bosnia. Peter realized that a revolution could never really succeed if the revolutionaries were at war with one another. So Peter departed from Bosnia after writing to Milan Obrenovic that he wished to make peace between their families. But Peter would be politically crucified by the Obrenoviches and members of the Serbian government that presented claims of treason to Peter for his actions in the Bosnian uprising. There would be only one way to clear his name. Peter would have to go home, and for real this time, and face the Serbian government to drop the treason charges. Just a year after he returned to his homeland, Peter would find himself running from Serbia. In 1878, he crossed into the Austrian border where he would once again hide from the plots and plans of the Obrenovic family. A year later in 1879, Peter would be sentenced to hang by the Serbian government. Luckily, Peter was back in his home away from home in Paris when they sentenced him. Another group of Serbian people had also gained their independence from the Ottomans. They claimed the tiny state of Montenegro and acquired their independence in 1858. The capital of this tiny country was the city of Setinji, and that is exactly where Peter would go in 1883. Why? The Montenegrin government was continuously separating itself more and more from neighboring Serbia, who moved closer towards a unification between the two countries. Montenegro did not want to be under Serbian rule, and this made for an easy alliance with the deposed Serbian Prince Peter. This alliance was cemented when Peter married the Princess of Montenegro, Zorka, in 1883. Two years later, in 1885, Peter's father, Alexander, would die and leave Peter as the head of the household that had no kingdom. Peter stayed with his wife's family and eventually blew through the remaining wealth that his father had left for him. While in Montenegro, Peter would raise his three surviving children, Alexander, George, and Helen, and remain in Montenegro until his children finished primary school. Then in 1894, Peter moved his family to Geneva a city that he had once stayed in for nearly a year, about 40 years ago. In 1899, Peter was invited to St. Petersburg, where his ally, Tsar Nicholas II, offered to put his two sons through the Russian military academy. This was obviously the best offer that his children would get to further their education, so he sent both Alexander and George to the academy. At the turn of the century, the last male member of the Obrenovich family came to the throne of Serbia in 1900. For some reason, he made the absolutely terrible decision of marrying an infertile woman that was disliked in the Serbian army. Tensions would eventually rise between the Serbian government and this king. The Serbian government would eventually murder the king and queen in their sleep on the 11th of July of 1903. Coincidentally, this was the 59th birthday of Peter, who would now be finally crowned as the king of Serbia. His coronation marked the end of a century-long family feud and the start of something new. Many called him the first South Slavic king that could unify all of the Southern Slavic nations, otherwise known as the Yugoslavic nations. Yugoslavia just means South Slav. Perhaps the oldest surviving newsreel ever was the coronation ceremony of Peter I. 
After the 1904 coronation, Peter set about making an official alliance with Russia and continuing a much-loved Serbian tradition of beating up the Ottoman Empire. The First Balkan War would start in October of 1912. This would pit the Ottoman Empire against the newly formed nations of Serbia, Greece, Bulgaria, and Montenegro. This coalition found great success and reduced the Ottomans to what is now present-day Turkey and Europe. It also saw the creation of a new Balkan state, Albania. Serbia would gain the territories of Kosara and Sardazak from the Ottomans. King Peter I would personally lead one of the Serbian armies that effectively beat the Ottomans. Serbian nationalism was at an all-time high, as around 10% of the total population of Serbia participated in this war. This war was a great success for the Balkan League, but one member felt cheated. Bulgaria. So when the Ottoman War ended, Bulgaria declared war on its former Balkan allies in 1913, starting the Second Balkan War. Bulgaria was eventually defeated, and Serbia would gain a portion of Bulgarian land along with Greece and Romania. Shortly after the Second Balkan War ended, an event would take place in southern Austria-Hungary. This province was home to many Serbians who wanted to join the expansive nation of Serbia, but couldn't due to Austro-Hungarian rule. A Serbian extreme nationalist group called the Black Hand could not accept this, and assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914. After this, Austria-Hungary would present Serbia an ultimatum to war that would leave them as a puppet, so they rejected 1 out of 25 Austrian demands. Then, Austria declared war on Serbia and Russia joined to protect the Russian ally, and World War I was officially underway. The Serbians put up a valiant defense. Even the 71-year-old King Peter could be found occasionally in the trenches, shooting enemy soldiers. But most of the military was under the direction of his generals, and his son Alexander. After a year of fighting off Austrian offenses, Serbia was ganged up on. Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Bulgarians would all team up to support a full-scale invasion of Serbia. When his country had lost hope to defend Serbia, it was King Peter who personally led perhaps as many as 100,000 people through Albania and to the Mediterranean coast, where a fleet of Greek ships would take them to the Greek island of Corfu in 1916. Peter I would remain there for the rest of the war, until peace was made in 1918. Then after the peace in 1918, King Peter took a play straight out of the books of Otto von Bismarck, as he used World War I to not just double his land through treaties, but also unify with the other Serbian nation of Montenegro, and incorporated it into his pan-Serbian kingdom. The pan-Serbian kingdom grew to so massive in World War I that it started to include a distinct number of ethnic groups inside of it, namely the Serbians, Croatians, Slovenians, and Bosnians, among others. King Peter had built a Yugoslavia nation that encompassed and brought together many South Slavic people. To show his compassion for these new ethnic groups entering his kingdom, Peter created a new title for himself. From now on, Peter I of Serbia would be Peter I of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, the exact predecessor for the nation of Yugoslavia. While he would be the first king of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes for the next three years until his death in 1921, at the age of 77, his son Alexander would succeed him and become the second king of Yugoslavia. Peter I took a small Serbia and eventually grew it, to become a unified nation of South Slavic Yugoslavic people. 